So hello everyone, welcome back to this week's Algebraic Graph Zero Seminar. This week we have Sam to talk about shadows and gaps in spatial search. Okay, thanks Tina. And thanks for the organizer for hosting the seminar and inviting me for the talk. And now I'm going to talk about of shadows and gaps in spatial search. This is a joint work with Ada, Chris, and Tino Weiser. And for more information, um, of, of the talk, we, we can check. You can check uh, our uh, archive preprint here. Okay. So uh, first, what is a spatial search? Uh, in one sentence, spatial search is uh, a search algorithm or graph where continuous time control work. So to be called a search algorithm, there must be a target vertex. So the target vertex is being multiplied by self loop. Um, the vertex W here <clears throat> and in my talk, I will abuse notation for the, the vertex W and the indicating vector for the vertex W. So it can be a vector or it can be the vertex itself. Okay. So all we have is the graph and the self loop. So we got to exploit these two information and we have a linear combination of these two, the constant multiplied by the abscissus matrix of the graph and plus the self loop. And it becomes the uh, total Hamiltonian of the uh, of the quantum world. So, so um, this is the H, the total Hamiltonian that governs the, the quantum world. So the game looks like this: you're given a graph. We have a graph, uh, and one of the vertex is being marked by a self loop. It can be marked by self loop by us, or it can also be marked by a oracle. Or some adversary, it's un, it may be unknown to us. And what we want is to let the system itself finding the target vertex by using the Schrodinger equation, okay? So the Schrodinger equation here, it looks strange. It looks different from the, the ordinary Schrodinger equation. It's because we're choosing the, the uh, quantum state as a dense matrix is not the, the state vector. So we have uh, the quantum state as a density matrix with the trace equals to one. And uh, having this, and then we solve the Schrodinger equation, we got the Schrodinger evolution of the density matrix equals to rho equals to the initial state conjugated by the uh, unitary unitary matrix e to the minus i h t and e to the i h t. And the h is the Hamiltonian we just saw. It's a linear combination of the uh, adjacency matrix plus the self loop. And it, the only uh, restriction for the h is it has to be a Hermitian matrix and it's automatically true here. So having a uh, Hermitian matrix, then we will get the eigenvalues are all real numbers. And then the, the unitary then then the unitary have vagan values of uh, complex numbers with, with uh, unit norm. <clears throat> so the good thing for the the the, the, the power for, for the quantum computing is the state has superposition that's saying you can simultaneously be in state zero and state one. And the carrier is you cannot read the information directly. You have to to, to read the information you have to perform a measurement. So we put the measurement on the current state and after the measurement, the state would be forced to collapse to another state. And this is a random process and the probability for this process is given by the trace of W times the current state. So in our case, we only care about whether the state uh, finds the target or not. So our W would be a projection on the, the target state. Um, and the probability of finding a target state will be the trace of W times the row T of row of T here. And uh, this is the probability and it's also called fidelity in our case. So we can take a final closer look to the spatial search. So first the graph, it has to be a kinetic graph. Otherwise we can uh, consider the kinetic component for, for the graph. So just assume it's a kinetic. <clears throat> and then we don't want to look at the normalized adjacency matrix. 
by saying normalized, we mean that all the eigenvalues are being trapped in between zero and one, and we force a decreasing order for the eigenvalues. So we have theta one bigger equal to theta, bigger than theta two, all the way to bigger than theta, theta t, and the theta one equals to one, and theta t is bigger equal to zero. And the er here is the eigen projector, <coughs> and the theta r is the eigenvalue of the underlying adjacency matrix. And then we also focus on the vertex W with the shadow uh, epsilon one. So the shadow is defined to be the uh, E1 multiplied by the W and take the norm. This is for a shadow. Um, we want the shadow be non-zero. And we also uh, require the shadow uh, is totally going to zero as n goes to infinity, because otherwise we can just take a measurement on the initial state and we can find the target with constant probability. So we, we have to assume this is going to zero also. And we, why do we care about it, the principal eigen projectors? Because that is our initial state. <clears throat> uh, this, this will give us convenience in the analysis. And also, when the graph is a regular graph, this uh, represents a uh, represents the, the random guessing. So we random we randomly choose uh, pick one of the the vertex that's the target because we don't know where is the target. So we, we have better just random guessing. So the, the probability for finding the target will be one over n here, if the, the graph is a, a regular graph. Then we can define the covariant. Uh, if we say gn is a gamma covariant, if for some time t of order one over epsilon, the state would yield a uh, constant fidelity. So, <coughs> Better is coming from the constant fidelity. If we just perform measurement at the very beginning, we only have one over n fidelity. So that is uh, is totally going to zero, and we want it to have a constant fidelity here after some time uh, of order one over epsilon. And we call it covariant. Uh, we call we call it graph. It's covariant if it's a gamma covariant. The gamma here is the con the tunable, uh, constant. So. Uh, it's worth to point out that um, this one over the time one over epsilon, this is the optimal time for for this behavior for finding for having a constant fidelity. The the, the shortest time it's the one over uh, epsilon. So that, that's why we call it an optimal spatial search. And when again when the graph is a, a regular graph. Then this one over epsilon actually becomes square root of n. So this recovers the famous square root n, uh, the, the quadratic speed up over the classical search algorithms. And mm. that's why we call the graph covariant, it's because the, uh, Grover is the first one that uh, brings out the uh, search algorithm or the, the quantum computing or, or the quantum search algorithm. and uh, it has a provable quadratic speed up over the classical uh, search algorithms. And it turns out global search is a discrete time quantum wall on clicks. <clears throat> and later, Fowler and Goodman uh, generalized the, the global search into a continuous time setting. So they have a analog analog. Uh, it's a, a continuous time quantum wall on a complete graph. And then later, Charles and Goldstone, they uh, use the same scheme on different graphs like the hypercube and the periodic lattices. <clears throat> so after that, <clears throat> people are looking at the families of graphs uh, to see whether they are covariant or not. So they will apply a, a ad hoc uh, analysis for different families of graphs. And it actually becomes a, a long standing open problem for what kind of graph uh, it's covariant. And then in 2016, Chakrabarty, Novo, and Banyas, and Omar, that's the four over here. <clears throat> uh, they, they, are, they look at it, they actually exploiting the spectral condition for the graphs. And they found if the graph, underlying graph, have a constant spatial gap, then the graph is covariant. Okay. And four years later, Chakrabarty, Novo, and Roland, uh, they 
they improve their own result and they they give a uh, uh, partial capitalization for the families of graph that's uh, being uh, covariant. <clears throat> so why do we look at the, the spatial uh, conditions? Because it's more general. Um, instead of looking at the families of uh, graph by family from, from one family to the other family, we can actually keep uh, the condition in a more general sense. For example, we want to know whether expanders are covariant. We know paley graphs are expanders and the cycles with the crossing edge that joining the, the uh, uh, module inverse, it's also a uh, uh, expanded graph. So in the, in the, if we are not looking at the uh, spatial condition, then we have to learn these two family, at least these two family, uh, family by family, and we have to uh, apply ad hoc analysis for these two. But if we have, a, uh, we're looking at the uh, spatial condition, we can tell actually that all, all expanders are covariant because the expanders having a constant uh, spatial gap. Okay, so here we have a simulation for the petty, 29, petty graph with 29 vertices with the target vertex being the number 10. And you can see uh, the, the amplitude of the, uh, or the probability of measuring the, the target. It's so significant in time equals to one, time equals to n. Okay. <clears throat> and also, uh, another example would be the, the Hamming graph, HNQ. We want to know whether this is a covariant uh, family. And Charles and Goldstone, they, they found uh, hyper-Qs are covariant. So that's when Q equals to two. And if we're looking at the spatial conditions, actually we know whenever Q is a constant, uh, the, hyper, the Hamming graph would be a uh, covariant. <clears throat> and again, this is a simulation for the H33. Uh, with the target vertex lying on the, the vertex number 10. Yeah. You can see after time, after a short time, the uh, probability of measuring the target state uh, would, would be so significant. So to see why this would work, uh, we have to uh, introduce our main result. <coughs> and uh, our main result would be uh, if the epsilon one is much less than square root of S1 times delta two, then we, we can say G is a S1 covariant if only if the S2 over S1 squared uh, is a constant, okay? So the rest of, the, uh, of my talk will be focused on the technical details for the proof of this theorem. Um, it's a general, it, we actually improves the, the theorem from Chaka Party at all. Uh, they have the two conditions and we actually uh, improve this condition to only one condition. Okay. <clears throat> so before we do in the technical proof, we got to fix some uh, terminologies. Again, the graph is a kinetic graph <clears throat> uh, with a normalized adjacency matrix A and the special decomposition of A equals to the sum of theta R times ER. Theta R are the eigenvalues and ER are the eigen projectors. And we, again, we force the decreasing order for the eigen values. So we have uh, one equals to theta one bigger than theta two, bigger than theta d to uh, bigger, bigger equal to zero. And the W is the vertex that being marked uh, and it has a shared of epsilon one equals to E one times W into the norm. Okay, this is the shadow on the principal eigen subspace. And then we call, um, and then we force the conditions uh, for theta one, theta two, they has to be on the support of W. That's saying the that W must have uh, non zero shadow on the first two eigen subspace. And for the, uh, for the shadow, for the shadow theta one, uh, we also require to be asymptotically going to zero. Otherwise we can just measure at the, at the very beginning. <clears throat> And we call a spatial gap delta r uh, equals to the largest eigenvalue minus the, the, the half making value. And the, since the largest eigenvalue equals to one, so it's one minus theta r is clearly less than one. 
And uh, SK, these are the magical numbers uh, we show in, in, in the previous, uh, in, in, the, in the theory up here, and it's showing up here and here. So they, there's some magical number that, that can be computed from the underlying graph. Uh, it looks like the moments when in the statistics, it's uh, something but the first one uh, of the shadow square over the spatial gap to the power k, the half spatial gap to the power k, okay? And now we check the total Hamiltonian as a reference perturbation uh, of the underlying graph. So we have H equals to gamma eight plus W W dagger, and we have the, the spatial decomposition H equals to the sum of zeta s times f s, and again zeta have a decreasing ordering. And by while in the latent theorem, immediately we, we can tell the largest two eigen uh, largest two perturbed eigen value zeta one zeta two was strictly interlacing with the uh, largest two unperturbed eigen values. Gamma S, uh, gamma theta one and gamma theta two, theta one is one, so I get another one here. Uh, the street interlacing is guaranteed by the by the non-trivial shadow. So the W because the W has non-zero shadow on the first two uh Aiken subspace, so it's uh, strictly interlacing, it's not equal here. And we denote the Delta plus minus as the difference between the uh, perturbed eigenvalues and the and the um, largest and perturbed eigenvalue. <clears throat> so it's zeta one minus gamma and z and gamma minus two. And our goal is to find the state transfer from the starting state e one to the to, to the target state w w dagger with a constant fidelity in time of order one over epsilon one. Okay. <clears throat> So the proof can actually be uh, be separated into five parts. The first part would be uh, finding some uh, finding a uh, uh, useful equality that is starting from the definition of uh, of the Aiken projector. So FP is the Aiken projector of W but of H. So it becomes uh, so we have S one A plus W W dagger operating on multiplied by the uh, FP equals to the eigenvalue multiplied by FP. And we can isolate the W, w dagger on one side and combine the other one to, to, to the other side. And then we uh, can write multiply with the W and then choose P equals to one and two. Because of the strict interlacing, we know the matrix zeta P I minus S one A is invertible. So we can multiply by the inverse matrix both sides and then dividing by uh, dividing by uh, the norm of the norm square of uh, FPW. So we got this expression here. Okay, and uh, clearly the left hand side is one, and the right hand side we can use the spatial decomposition again. We open it up, we got a sum, and we separate the first term because it's special. It has uh, it, it looks like epsilon one square over delta plus minus. And the others, we can factor out the S1 times delta R. So we have this term, and we also have a one over one plus delta plus minus over the S1 or times delta R. And by using this formula for the for, for these tails, uh, we can get the yellow representation here. <clears throat> okay, so Looking at the yellow representation, uh, the, the equation, we, we see if somehow we can uh, factor out this uh, S1 delta R over delta plus minus plus uh, S1 delta R, we can factor it out of the sum. Then by using the definition of S2, then we've got S2 over S1 square times the constant, then it equals to epsilon one square over delta square. And in fact, this is the case. And this uh, this fraction here, it's not just any constant; it's actually one. Okay. So we need to show that delta plus it's asymptotically much smaller than s one delta r. So that's the next step. We got to use the Cauchy equality. 
um, we were first looking at the characteristic polynomial for the perturbed matrix uh, or, the, or the total Hamiltonian H here. And, it, and we view it as a random perturbation. So we isolate the W W dagger R. And by Cauchy uh, equality, it equals to the characteristic polynomial for the S1A multiplied by one minus the residual conjugated with the W W dagger. So we got this summation here. Okay. And, uh, and now we can see uh, the, the roots of the characteristic polynomial are the eigenvalues. So here we got the, the first, we, we actually focus on the first two uh, perturbed eigenvalues. And by while interlacing, we know the unperturbed eigenvalues must lie, lie this way. So it's in between uh, S, uh, Z1 and Z2 lies the S1, and, and the S1 times theta2 must uh, be less than Z2. Okay. So the next thing is um, if, uh, because we want to bound the delta, delta plus and delta minus, and delta plus minus actually is the gap in between the Z1 and Z2 and the S1, okay? So, if, so how can we bound it? If we can find uh, a S1 plus beta and, and, and minus beta, and we evaluate the characteristic polynomial at these two points, and we got a positive number, <clears throat> Then we can say the beta is the bound for the delta, for the delta plus minus. Okay, and it turns out to be if we plug in s one plus minus beta and the original uh, characteristic polynomial is always positive, so we can safely ignore it because we only focus on bigger than zero, and it turns out to be it's one minus this residual bigger than zero, and by uh, posting a stronger condition on the beta because we want this thing bigger than zero and so so this sum would be, big, would be bigger than one and we posting a stronger condition we, we saying that the smallest uh, of this the smallest number of uh, smallest value of this sum is, is bigger than one then then we actually get a uh, quadratic uh, inequality for the beta and we can solve the beta um, that 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 quadratic inequality would be a kind of uh, 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 evolving. So I just ignore it here. But trust me, it can be solved. And solving the beta, we can find uh, the bound for the delta plus minus. So the bound would be uh, square root of s one times epsilon one. That's using the fact that uh, epsilon one is uh, is intuitively small and. Uh, yeah, the, just using the fact that epsilon one is intuitively small. So <clears throat> having this uh, condition and combined with our condition, epsilon one is intuitively small than F, uh, square root of S one times delta two. We immediately can find uh, delta plus minus must be is intuitively much smaller than S one delta two. And since it's more than delta two, then it must be smaller than all the delta R's because R is bigger than equal to two, okay? So this, this term is uh, actually it's one. And therefore we have epsilon one square over delta square is, is it basically the same as S2 over S1 square. <clears throat> and then the next thing is we have, uh, again, starting from the definition of the, the uh, Aiken projector and we dividing by the, uh, the matrix that that's, we multiply by the inverse of the matrix and divide by the, the FW, uh, FPW norm square, then we got this uh, uh, equation. <clears throat> and we take the outer product of this thing itself. So we've got one over uh, FP times W norm square equals to the square of the inverse matrix conjugated by the WW data. Okay, so we're just taking the taking the, uh, the outer product of this guy, the right-hand side, the right-hand side would be double, and the left-hand side would be, would be the left-hand side for this equation here. And again, we use the special decomposition, open it up and isolate the first term, we've got epsilon one square over delta square. And for the remaining parts, we uh, factor out the S one square and delta R square. 
So by factoring out, we got this tail, we got the one over one plus delta over S1 delta R squared. And again, because delta plus minus is asymptotically much smaller than S1 over uh, S1 delta R. So this whole fraction is just one, a constant one. And then by the definition of S2 again, this sum is an S2 and we got S2 over S1 squared. And S2 over S1 squared is just the same as S epsilon one squared over delta squared. So we got two times epsilon one squared over delta squared. And the last, last term is this one. <coughs> uh, we starting at, starting at, uh, at, at, at the, again, starting from the uh, definition of uh, uh, Aiken projector. So Aiken projector, uh, the H times Aiken projector equals to Aiken value multiplied by Aiken projector. And then we, um, this time we, we not multiply by the inverse of the matrix, but we multiply by the principal Aiken vector, Aiken projector for the uh, original uh, matrix A. Then we got an E1 here. Uh, this norm square is a number, so we can swap it. Uh, so it becomes E1 times W, and uh, E1 times times this uh, zeta p i minus s1 a. Actually, it turns out to be E1. It's a uh, it's also a Aiken projector for this matrix because it's an identity and a. So they they commute, and that's why uh, we can we can swap this uh, guys, and and we got the Aiken value z of p minus s1 times e1 and then e1 operating on the fpw here okay and then we focus on the right hand side and we take the norm <coughs> so we got the norm of e1 fpw equals to uh, the left hand side fpw norm square e1 w the norm of e1 w and then dividing by dividing by this constant and this constant, if we focus on p equals to one and two, the constant is just delta plus and minus. So we got this term here. So we got the, the shadow over the, the delta plus minus. And then this fp square, we using the we using the, the previous result, fp uh, operating on w norm square, it's just delta square over epsilon square over two. So we got this expression here, okay. So these are the, the terms if we want to uh, do a asymptotic estimation and then we can compute the fidelity <clears throat> because the fidelity goes to the trace of the, the, the projector times the state so it becomes WW dagger times e to the minus IHT, e1 into the IHT. And then we uh, use the special decomposition to open up the matrix exponential. So we got a double sum here, uh, summing for P and Q, and then e to the minus IT, zeta P minus zeta Q, uh, W dagger, F P E1, F Q, W. Okay. And this term, Actually, it's the inner product of <clears throat> it's the inner product of these two vectors, uh, e1 e1 f p w and e1 f q w, and then and then because e1 f p w and e1 f q w can uh, can be written as e a constant multiplied by e1 w, so by using this this uh, equation. So we will get the FPW square norm square over the over the zeta p minus s one times FQW norm square over zeta q s one. These are constants, and then the inner product becomes e one w of inner e one w itself. So it becomes e one w norm square. It's a, it's a vector, and this complex number is always having. Uh, attaching here so got this uh, equation and now we separate the, the total sum into two parts 
the, the P and Q equals to one and two and the others, okay? So for P equals to one equals to Q and P equals, P equals to Q equals to two, uh, we have the one times the delta square over epsilon square because this uh, E1 W norm square is just epsilon square and we're using uh, the approximation we got previously for, for these two terms. Uh, we got the delta square over two epsilon square for these two terms. And then this uh, and, and the, nominator, the, the denominator, it's, it's just the delta plus and delta minus. And because delta plus and minus, they have the same uh, amplitude. So it's just the same, it's just the delta E. And for the P and Q are not the same, but uh, P equals to one, Q equals to two, and P equals to two, Q equals to one, we actually get the real part of this uh, complex number. So it becomes cosine of two delta times T. And always we have this uh, delta square over epsilon square. So uh, the remainders are all positive. So we can just ignore it. And it, it turns out to be a bigger equal to the first term. And the first term, if we set the time to be pi over two delta, so it becomes cosine pi here, then it becomes a minus one. So the two and one and over two cancels. So it becomes uh, delta square over epsilon square. And it's asymptotically the same as S1 square over S2. <clears throat> and the time pi over two delta would be asymptotically the same as pi over two times square root of S2 over S1 times one over epsilon. And now we can see as long as S2, S1 square over S2 is a constant, then we got the fidelity would be bigger equal to a constant. And our time would be a constant multiplied by one over square, uh, one over epsilon. So we know GN is S1 covariant. Okay. <clears throat> and this is the sufficient part. And uh, for the necessary, we got to use another theory of a, the, another theory. Uh, if G is a, covari a gamma covariant, then the shadow and the gaps must be asymptotically of the same order. And if this theorem is true, then it's easy to prove our, our main examples. Uh, because we can see if S1 over S2 is not a constant, then it's saying the delta square over epsilon square is not a constant. Then it's saying either delta will be much bigger than epsilon or delta will be much smaller than the epsilon. In either case, they, 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 they will not have the same order. So they cannot be, so the GN cannot be a S1 covariant. And that proves the, the, the necessary part of the same one. And now um, we can look, take a, um, let me not, not focus on the on the proof of the uh, of the of this uh, statement. Okay, I also have it, but it's kind of evolving. But he, he actually is just saying uh, if it's epsilon one is much much smaller than the, the delta, then the fidelity will be will be uh, uh, less uh, will be asymptotically zero. And the other way is also true if. Delta is much smaller than epsilon one, then the fidelity would be uh, asymptotically zero, so it cannot be a constant. <clears throat> so what we have is by looking at the spatial condi uh, the, the spatial conditions mm -hmm. of the graph, we can find new family of graphs that's being uh, covariant. We have the Hamming graph, uh, like we mentioned before. As long as the, the Q is a constant, then it's a covariant. <clears throat> And we also have the, the Grossman graph. That is a generalization of the, the uh, Johnson graph. And we got if the Q and D are constant, then it's then it has a constant spatial gap. So automatically it's a uh, covariant graph. And also we have the distance regular graph with classical parameter and D alpha beta. And this is also uh, covariant because the 
spatial gap is a constant here. And finally, we have a uh, interesting observation here. So it is said that the cycles are not covariant for, for large uh, vertices. <clears throat> and actually we can, we actually prove uh, this statement vigorously in our uh, archive preprint. And even though the cycle cannot be covariant, but if we adding the, the crossing edges by joining the uh, modular inverse, then it becomes a three regular expander and it becomes a covariant. So we have a simulation like this. Uh, on the right hand side, we have a cycle of vertex 251 uh, with the, mark, the target vertex at number five. So we can see the, uh, the probability or amplitude uh, can barely move. It's almost uh, just zooming at zero all the time. And on the right hand side, if we add in the, the crossing edges <coughs> at, uh, at a short time, uh, you can see the uh, probability of measuring the uh, target state would be significantly larger than the others in a short time. Uh, same thing happens if we uh, change the target vertex from number five to num uh, the number 100. So we can see. Uh, uh, for the cycle, the amplitude or the probability can uh, barely move. Uh, it may try to move up, but, but it cannot be, uh, be significantly different from the others. And for the uh, extended cycle, you can see the amplitude or, uh, or the probability is significantly different from the others. So that's what, that's what we're saying by letting the system run and let the system find the target by itself. Okay. So if we perform a measurement at time, at, at, the, at this time, uh, we will have a high probability to measure the, uh, the target state. <clears throat> so what we have is uh, we generalized, uh, we improved the long result uh, uh, from the, uh, the, the long result from the charter body at all. But still, uh, we, we are not uh, causing the whole problem because the whole problem is to find uh, whether a, there is a uh, general characterization for the graph that's being covariant and we can only find uh, the covariant graph under some family of graphs, okay, under the condition that epsilon one, which is more than square root of s one times delta two. So we actually want to know is there uh, it is the spectral condition it's uh, essential for for finding for being a covariant so we want to know whether uh, the spectral condition can fully describe the whole family of covariant and the next thing is we want to know um, how necessary this condition would be because this condition is actually uh, we obtain this obtention uh, this condition from having a better approximation for the delta plus and minus that is uh, coming from the, the wild delaying and the Cauchy equality. And we actually don't know how necessary or how, uh, how far can we push this, this condition. <clears throat> we want to know uh, if, if there's a way to squeeze it to a, uh, to, a, to, a, to, a, to a more relaxed condition or not. And then the next thing is uh, to the best of, of uh, my knowledge, uh, all the go all the Gaussian graphs, they will have uh, the S one being at most a constant. It can be constant or it can be uh, asymptotically going to zero, like the Hamming graph. But none of these uh, long examples showing the S one being asymptotically going to infinity. So we want to know if if there is any examples uh, for this one. And for the number four, uh, Gaussian implying the period periodicity. So uh, the best I can say is if uh, we can determine the covariant by using our theory, then we know it's, it's, uh, it, it's uh, periodic, combined with a small oscillation, but in the long-term behavior, in, in, the, in the rough behavior, the rough behavior, it, it will be a periodic behavior. But if you zoom in, you will see a small oscillation inside the 
uh, inside the, the, the periodic. So we want to know whether, in general, Gorevan implies the periodic or not. <clears throat> and the last is, uh, of course, we want if we want to do the implementation in the in the real settings, we want to know how how robust uh, Gorevan graph to the noise. And And this uh, all of uh, my presentation and thanks for attending. Thank you. Uh, so is there any questions? Uh, uh yes you can just unmute yourself i see there's the raised uh, yeah i have a uh, thanks for your talk and then that was interesting and i have a just simple question so uh normalizer uh normalized the distance matrix and then assumption is that eigenvalues are all eigenvalues between zero and one you, yeah. uh, what is the exact definition for that so uh the normalization, okay, here. <clears throat> the, the normalization between zero and one, that, that is the, because we want to compare the, uh, keep a reasonable comparison for the time. Okay, if the, the adjacency matrix is not being normalized, then it kind of saying you have a high energy for the uh, evolution, then your time can be shorter. So we want to have a reasonable comparison for the time. So we fix the adjacency matrix in between zero and one, then, then the energy is between zero and one, then the time, then we can compare the time. Uh, That's about the comparison of the time because uh, you, you can, you actually may not uh, need to do the, the, the uh, normalization here. And if you're not doing that, then your adjacency matrix will have a high energy because the highest uh, vacant value will be for example, for the complete graph, it will be n minus one. And as n goes to infinity, your, your energy will be infinity. And you will have, uh, within this uh, high energy, uh, the time you, you, keep, you, you get the, the constant fidelity, the time will be so short. So there's no way to compare the time at, at that sense. So, to compare the time, we have to fix the, the, the energy level to be between zero and one. Uh, so, um, okay, so A is defined, uh, so normalized means um, multiplying D to the power of minus one over two, uh, left and right, you multiply that matrix both sides. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, usually adjacency matrix does not have uh, all positive eigenvalues. Yes. Eigenvalues. Yes. yes. Sam, Sam, what is the definition of the normalized matrix? It, it, it just says that the uh, eigenvalues are trapped in between zero and one. So what you can not do the definition is, of the matrix. I'm sorry? It's a property you want to have. What is the definition of the normalized adjacency matrix? Uh, okay, that would be the, the adjacency matrix minus the smallest eigenvalue times infinity dividing by the highest eigenvalue minus the smallest eigenvalue. Then you will get all the all the eigenvalues are between zero and one. Uh, so uh, okay, so a minus uh, smallest eigenvalue times i. Yes, and then divided uh, okay. by the, by the uh, largest second value minus the smallest second value. Uh, then you can zoom, you can, you can squeeze it to one. Okay, oh uh, yeah, okay, yes. thanks.